This time on episode 343 of Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D., we're going to discuss Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Season 7, Episode 10, Stolen, and your feedback. I'm Chris from Play Comics, a show where we look at video games based on comic properties and how well they stick to that source material, a part of the Gunna Geek Network, just like the show you're checking out now. Shows on the network are individually owned, and opinions expressed may not reflect others. Find other astonishingly geeky shows at GunnaGeekNetwork.com. Now it's time for your scheduled debriefing. I'm Director SP. And I'm Executive Assistant to the Traveling Deputy Director Secretary Stephen John Drew. Welcome to Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D., a Marvel Comic Universe fan show. The show is recorded on Thursday, July 30th, 2020, live from the Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. studios and broadcast timeline-wide via www.geeks.live. Come join our live chat as we record. Stephen, happy National Cheesecake Day. I was so excited to hear it was happy uh, National Cheesecake Day. I think that's the official title because you can't have sad cheesecake, so it's happy National Cheesecake Day uh, because I enjoy cheesecake a lot. The other thing I wasn't really sure about here, this is the National Day calendar, and I assume it's the National United States of America Day calendar. And since you were going to be on the podcast, I wasn't quite sure. So I'm so glad that you enjoy cheesecake enough just to run with the gag. You know what? Uh, we have the power, I think, to make it international. Happy Cheesecake Day. All right. So just you being here, we are now International Cheesecake Day. I do love a good like Cheesecake Factory cheesecake. Do you guys have Cheesecake Factory up there? Not in my area. I don't know if it's in Canada. However, I have been to a Cheesecake Factory before. My daughter's been a couple of times the last couple of weeks, and she's brought home a very expensive but very delicious piece of cheesecake for me. I keep telling her not to do it because, you know, calories and they're expensive, but she brings them home anyway. So that's what I think of when I'm thinking of cheesecake is stopping the podcast right now, getting in the car, driving to the Cheesecake Factory. I happen to have one within 10, 15 minutes driving distance and getting a slice of cheesecake. And I would share it with you, but you're more than 15 minutes away. All I know is that when I went, uh, it did not look like any factory that I've ever seen. <laughs> you have not been to the back of Cheesecake Factory. <laughs> and with that, let's just get on to the rest of the show. Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. is a fan based podcast on the ABC television show Marvel's Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., the multiple Marvel small screen series, and the Marvel Cinematic and Comic Book Universes in general. Because of Dallas season finales. If you want to talk to us about 1980s drama shows with very dramatic endings like Who Shot JR, you can catch us on our website, legendsofshield.com. You can leave us a voicemail message of your favorite 80s drama series, maybe it's Dynasty, at 844-THE-BUS-1 or 844-843-2871. You can leave us a message on our Facebook page about your favorite Dallas moment. You can leave us a message on Twitter if you liked the start of Dallas and the big intro with the Cowboys, the old, I guess now, Cowboys Stadium. You can leave a comment on our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash gonna geek all about how it's, yeah, it's there. And then you can enable your Amazon device to play this podcast on Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. using the Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. skill. And remember, Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. is a proud member of the GunnaGeek.com network, which is owned by my guest host for this executive assistant to the shoe shiner, Stephen Jonker. <laughs> oh, which, by the way, uh, there is a Gunna Geek Discord server. There's a little, little channel in there for Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. if you want to check that out. And I heard that after this show, SP was going to create a Dallas channel as well. About the TV show Dallas or uh -huh. the city Dallas? TV show. Dedicated to the TV show Dallas. I've seen probably about half the episodes, <laughs> which is remarkable because it wasn't, it wasn't my thing. 
I think I just watched literally before. This is how I'm drawn in the series. It was the grandiose intro series with the orchestra and the, and the big band and stuff. And then just the way they did the intro with the sliding scenes as they went past. And then you got the mansion at the end that I forget what the ranch was called. Do you remember what the ranch was called? Never seen an episode of the da- of Dallas. Don't. Neither the <laughs> reboot or the pat. You're, you'll be a better man for it. Well, Steven is here. He is my co-host for the week. Unfortunately, Michelle needed to take a personal day. She will be back next week. Uh, also, Lauren needed a personal day. She hopefully will be back next week. And Haley had to get on a plane because she heard I was messing stuff all up. She was just really disappointed because there was like this earthquake thing out in California when the launch of Mars 2020 happened today. and. She's like, SP had to have something to do with it, and I got to go fix it now. So she is not with us either, but hopefully we'll have a full slate next week for the penultimate episode of Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. on Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. I should just say right now that you're being far too kind, and just like every party that I've ever been to, I was invited to come on the show and nobody else wanted to join. So that's that's just the truth right there sp is just hiding the truth there's a little bit of truth to that because you weren't the only (laughs) invitation that i accept all right with that we're just going to get into the main event and we're going to talk about agents of shield episodes stole it agents of shield season seven episode 10 stolen was broadcast on abc july 29th 2020 and placed on hulu for streaming on july 30th 2020 it was directed by gary a brown who has seven directing credits starting in 1985 a little back to the future action right there he did not direct back to the future by the way he has a directing credit for an episode of who's the boss one episode of walker texas ranger two episodes of prison break and 11 Count them. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 episodes of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. The episode was written by a trio. It was story by Mark Brunner, who has five directing credits starting in 2009, with an episode of Criminal Minds, two episodes of Steven's favorite show. I keep bringing this up every time we talk about two episodes of Under the Dome. Steven, this is your favorite show, right? It's not my favorite show, but... I enjoyed it. It was good summer TV. All right. And then there was two episodes <laughs> of Le- of Legends of Tomorrow, also good summer TV in the past couple of years. One episode of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. story only. The episode was written by George Kitson, which the planet Kitson, by the way, that was George Kitson. And he has five writing credits starting in 2006, including five episodes of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Double Agent, one episode of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Slingshot, and seven episodes of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. And the final writer of the trio on this episode, it was written by Mark Leitner, who has three writing credits starting in 2013, one episode of Spartacus, two episodes of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Slingshot, and four episodes of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. The Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. showrunners are husband and wife team, Marissa Takeron and Jed Whedon. Yeah, Jed is the brother of Joss Whedon. And they have been the showrunners for all seven seasons of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. You know, it's hard to find a, a series that has consistent showrunners for the entire length if you get to like five, six, seven seasons, right, Steven? You know, I think if we were to look at some of the other seasons of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., there might have been grounds for that shuffle to ha- have happened sooner where, you know, you see that like with The Walking Dead, there was a big lull and then all of a sudden some showrunners changed and things like that. There was definitely a lull in Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., but kudos to ABC for letting it continue on uh, with the people that were behind it because they pulled themselves up from that lull, and uh, it's been a fun ride over the last seven years, and I like the consistency that came by having this the consistent showrunners. I think we're going to get some payoffs in the last two weeks of the show. We'll talk about that later. Now, Stephen, we often equate the theme of the episode to the title of the episode. The title of the episode is Stolen. We tweeted earlier on the Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. Twitter account before the episode yesterday, we tweeted, just remember, as you're watching this show, drive it like you stole it. I don't think it was that kind of stolen. So please enlighten everybody. What are they talking about when they talk stolen? 
Uh, it's clearly because the 80s stole Deke's heart. There's no other other meaning it could be. Not only Deke's heart, but John Garrett's heart as well, because he remembers watching the Deke squad open for Twisted Sister. That's true. That's true. Uh, it could also be, too. I don't know if you caught that one scene, but there was that whole conversation about how Coulson had his wallet stolen. I think that might have been the other meaning, but I think it was the 80s. I think it was his lanyard and badge that was stolen by Pat Oswalt. That was a wallet. There was a whole conversation about how he had this brand new leather wallet. Uh, it was from the future. You didn't see that scene? Apparently, that was on the Canadian-only broadcast last night. <laughs> <laughs> so stolen, it's stolen in many ways. You've got Daisy's mother is stolen from her because she's killed eventually by Nathaniel Malik. You've got Gemma Simmons, who was stolen from the team. She has been stolen away. Deke was stolen with her, although they don't know that Deke's with them. You've got a bunch of Inhumans that were stolen from Afterlife to brought back into Team Shield. And you've got Team Shield, which were in the lighthouse, that weren't actually part of Shield. I, you know, that is a funny <laughs> scene, right? Yeah. So, so uh, Roxy Glass is welcoming everybody in the lighthouse and she's like, well, I gotta go. I'm, I, you know, I gotta get back to the Academy and, and I got an assignment to the Triskelion. I gotta go. And it turns out Deke wasn't able to get us into shield. So how did that go? Did shield actually come in and storm the base? And they're like, what are you guys doing here? And they're like, we're shield. And then how'd that conversation go? Because they have no idea who Deke is in 1983. Yeah. I was wondering the same thing. How did that conversation all go down? But uh, I'm sure there was something to the effect of, yeah, well, we were at the bar and there's this guy that was there. and We started a band and he said we could be part of S.H.I.E.L.D. You believe us, right? Uh, how many drinks did you have? I uh, had a lot. Uh, did you have any other things? Uh, yeah, I had a lot of that, too. So I'm pretty sure they just blamed the other things for, for the, the craziness. But because they've been down in the lighthouse so long, they actually had to take them back. It's, it's kind of like, well, the best thing to do here is just make you part of real S.H.I.E.L.D. So we yeah. don't have to explain this. And we don't <laughs> have to worry about you guys writing a tell-all book or something like that. So I think how that's going to go down. The team is still out there and they're actual S.H.I.E.L.D. agents. So if the team actually goes forward in time to say like the 90s next episode or whatever, these are going to be effective S.H.I.E.L.D. agents, which they can go back and bring back to i don't know what let's just call it team lighthouse shield or something like that yeah um the other thing i think with the stolen reference that we should mention as well is that obviously inhuman powers were stolen <laughs> i think that that that's another thing we should probably mention you think <laughs> so yeah there's inhuman powers that were being stolen back and forth and one of the inhuman powers that was stolen was gordon's teleporting capability which was put in Bill Paxton's son. It was actually Bill Paxton's son. His name is James Paxton. He is Bill Paxton's son. And he was playing John Garrett. So a very young John Garrett. As the son of acclaimed actor Bill Paxton, wouldn't it be neat to be able to play the same character that your dad played, even if it was only for an episode or two, just to be in the same role as your dad, just to bring that forward. I think Regardless of what you think about his performance, I think that was a really neat thing to do for James Paxton. Yeah, I agree. I think that that's a really cool thing that he got to do. I think that it kind of it allows us to see another actor in that role because of the fact that there was a nice little uh, family moment there. They've done that in uh, movies, too. Uh, what was the oh, I can't remember the name, the Fast and the Furious guy that they had. Oh, there's his the brother. brother, his brother. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry, I'm drawing a blank on the name, but I think that that kind of eases us in a little bit. I got to say, I don't know that he nailed the character that his dad built. I wasn't feeling it. I felt like it, he uh, he was not the character that we knew. Um, just the mannerisms, the the delivery, I felt like it didn't land compared to Bill Paxton. But it was cool, though, that it was his son. So I give credit where credit's due that that's cool. I was having trouble getting into it at first, and I've seen this three times already. I watched it last night live, I watched it on the treadmill, and then I watched it again as I was making notes at a faster speed. Every time I watched it, 
I saw more and more of Bill Paxton's mannerisms in James Paxton. Now, they're not perfect. They're not exactly how Bill would have done him. But you have to go back to the Bill Paxton of like the aliens time frame. You have to go back to the early Bill Paxton. And those are kind of the mannerisms that he brought forward. The Bill Paxton that we knew before his he passed away, it was a different, it was a more experienced actor. And he had perfected his acting and his style and everything. He was in a bunch of stuff along the way. He was in a, a television show called Big Love. So he had a lot of prime acting on that television show. And his son just doesn't have all that. Plus, his son is his own man. I mean, you're trying, imagine you trying to portray your father or your stepfather or somebody that has helped raise you. If you don't have any of that, it would be difficult. Yeah. The other thing that I, I was kind of thinking about while I was looking and, and feeling a disconnect was the fact that obviously this is also a version of the character that was before the stuff hit the fan of the character that we knew, because there's the whole story about about how he came to be into Hydra and tech and this character was before all that stuff happened. Like he was top of his class at shield. So clearly he was a more wholesome sort of character. So he was this, this moment in time, he was this more wholesome character, but he was now turning evil. So we were kind of in the process of that. So it was a weird balance, but just knowing that, that we'd seen so much of uh, the character as full on evil. It was, it was hard. It was hard. For me, having seen Bill Paxton do such a great job. Now, I'm going to mind frack you a little bit because Bill Paxton, when, or excuse me, uh, John Garrett, when he was in S.H.I.E.L.D., he was trained by Nick Fury. Coulson was trained by Nick Fury. I think they were trained about the same time. So I'm thinking they kind of already knew each other or should have known each other when John sees Coulson. And Coulson really hasn't changed all that much. So I think that Garrett would have known. But I'd have to go back into the timeline and know for sure when both Coulson and Garrett were becoming S.H.I.E.L.D. agents. And they have the trump card on this show by saying Sybil has disrupted the timeline left, right, and backwards. So you never know what that has done to different people coming in and out of S.H.I.E.L.D. So even if we did go back and try to pinpoint it, it's not the same in this timeline. I got two considerations on that front. Number one, the fact that where is Coulson of that era? I would like to have seen that. I thought we were going to see Coulson of that, that era since, you know, they didn't know each other, right? Uh, the second thing, though, is that how is it that Coulson can remember exactly what he remembered in the previous episode, but then, um, or two episodes ago, like he knew, he knew exact details of S.H.I.E.L.D. When it, and we, kind of, I guess it was a few episodes ago that we chalked it up to him being an LMD and the fact that he's got like, you know, photographic memory, but he doesn't know who Garrett is because he knew him at that age or around that age. And when you're at that age, you don't change that much physically. So he he shouldn't have been surprised to have seen Garrett. I don't know, man. I went to college with some people I barely recognize now. So it yeah, but that's a lot further of a time. Like we're talking maybe 10 years probably less than that five ten years that was between the point that we saw in this episode and when they would have known each other in shield they're not going to look that he's not going to have changed right. that much in five to ten years so colson right there should have been like oh i know who you are he should have again it's the whole timeline thing remember they were talking about it like the triskelion shouldn't have been there for a couple of years yet like five years yeah. or something like that it's 1983 and triskelion shouldn't exist yet so Sybil has definitely disrupted the timeline, and I will say it's not just Sybil. It's the actions of Team Shield has also enacted changes in the timeline. Yeah, it's hard for me to think about right now where we're going with this. Are these permanent changes? Are we going with the the actual movie time travel where this is now a fork in the road? Like, I'm confused on what's going to happen here. I think the door is wide open for a great many things. And, and I'll give some examples. 
of why I think that. So the time drive is broken right now, but is it really broken? Uh, you have some things to say about that. We'll get to that later. Jiang is dead, which means Daisy might not exist, or is it Daisy existing the same way that Deke is existing? There is a bunch of stuff, and then the Inhumans themselves, they're wiped out of afterlife, basically. So that means the whole future with Inhumans might not happen. And my overarching thought on this, it's nefarious, but it I, I need to say it, is that this is almost, and, and we just gave a lot of acclaim to the showrunners, so I'm not going to take anything away from them. But is this a cheap writer's trick from this show to take all that and wipe it from the MCU memory? That's a good question. I think we'll have to see how they play out with this time travel thing, because if we see the sort of infinity war logic come to play where they had said they had that whole explanation in, sorry, I should say end game in end game where I think it was end game where they said when you time travel, you don't actually kill you. You don't actually kill yourself by changing the events because you fork off. I forget what they said. They had this whole convoluted thing that was nearly a throwaway line, but was very important. If we see that happen in this, then they're not trying to change too much and they're following the rest of the MCU's logic. I don't know. I, honestly, <laughs> it's a it's such a crapshoot right now. If the lady agents were here right now, we'd go back and forth and Haley's kind of the we joke and say Haley is our time travel expert because, well, she podcasts on Gallifrey Public Radio, which is a podcast about Doctor Who, which is all about time travel, and time and space. So she's kind of our expert there. But even she at the beginning of the season was like, oh, I, didn't, I have no idea where they're going on this. They have three more episodes. Next week will be the penultimate week. And then the final two episodes will be a back to back episode. That's all we got. We got three episodes after this. I have to think that they're going to do the last bit of setup next week, and then it'll just be wall-to-wall -wall action for two hours. We'll see if that happens or not, but I think that's what we got left. So the story is got one more episode to solidify before it gets to the finale episode. Let's get back to the time drive being broken, because is it broken? Is it not broken? Was the time drive following Enoch? Was it following Fitz? Was it following the Chromicons? What do you think, Steve? I can't help but think that it was tied to Enoch. I'm worried. I'm worried now that Fitz is dead. I said it last episode, the lady agents about... They stabbed me through the internet, basically, <laughs> with their eyes. They didn't say anything for five seconds. I timed it in the editing afterwards. I didn't add any. I didn't take it away. It was exactly their response it was like daggers were coming out and i'm like yeah well with Gemma's reaction i think he's dead can i cross streams here a little bit that there is a television show that yourself and michelle did a podcast on called the starling tribune it was based it was covering this television show arrow and we saw a major character die off and get the warm fuzzy romantic resolve at the very end we saw that happen over on Arrow. Sorry, spoiler alert. I never thought that would work as a finale sort of thing. And I can't help but think that Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. might be able to pull it off as well. If somehow there is like a not real death, but like a like a, it is a death like we saw over on Arrow. And yet Fitzsimmons can come back together at the end somehow. I think they could pull it off. I thought that they were throwing us off last episode with the whole over dramatic what's happening, super upset. But given we only have a couple episodes left, um, we don't have the actor in this. I the time travel's not happening anymore. Enoch had some programming that he didn't know about that nobody knew about. I think he very well could have been doing that and the whole Fitz is controlling it was part of the memory or part of the plant, I should say, the programming in order to make Simmons go and, and get continue on. I think that you probably were right. I think he's dead and I hope I'm wrong, but I think you are correct. I hope I'm wrong too, but it's leaning hard towards that. And if you want to talk about the good romantic ending that 
Arrowhead. Let's think of the different ways that it could happen. The framework is pretty obvious. You have framework, you could have both Fitz and Gemma go into the framework and live happily ever after there. It's kind of like a deck in the S.H.I.E.L.D. headquarters that you used to have, and they had the whole hologram wedding a few seasons ago. I think it's a natural progression there, so that's one way. I guess another way is just time travel into a timeline that they're both alive and maybe none of this ever happened. That's another way. There's numerous different things that could happen to give them the good, warm, fuzzy ending and Team Shield not be Team Shield anymore. Here's another prediction. Because Enoch said this will be your last mission together, and because we've seen things like Daisy's mom is now dead because her spine is crushed that killed her last time, and so she can't regenerate. Although there's, I guess there's the possibility that she could regenerate, but I think it's safe to say that she's dead here. That, uh, you know, Deke and Daisy go bye-bye, and that the rest of the team might not remember what happened. There might be one, one left. And you have different relationships that that will break. You have the burgeoning Daisy Souza relationship. We'll talk about that in a second. You have the Yo-Yo Mac relationship. You have the Felinda relationship. And of course, Simmons and Fitz relationship. And I don't know if any of those survive. Yeah, it's really hard to think about the end at this point here just because there are so many different ways that they could go. And also, I think it's worth acknowledging the fact that Coulson's dead, but he's not dead. So that's another possibility. Like, they almost gave us that right at the beginning. Like, here you go. Look, someone's dead, but there's a way that they're kind of not dead. Almost as like preparing us for Fitz is dead. But don't worry, we've, we've set the groundwork so that they can still get together at the end in some weird way. Because if Felinda can happen, then Robot Fitz Simmons can happen. I don't know. Like they, they just seem like maybe that was also part of the setup. I, I think he's dead. Yeah, uh, big sigh there. All right, let's go to a callback, a Marvel callback callback so dr grady i had to look this up and if the ladies were here they'd be able to tell me a little bit about it steven you were a comic book guy for a little bit you might know this and you might not dr eric grady was actually a hank pym character a limited comic run character very distasteful character by the way uh i'm, I'm not going to even mention what all he did here it just he is a bad guy in the comics and just take it as that and we only get the one scene with him but that was a Marvel comic callback right there when the, he was getting the time stream ready for John Garrett to go in and, and see the time stream. And that would be cool, by the way. It would be cool and not cool because you see your own death along the way. But you could go further in the time stream and see how your kids turn out and stuff like that. So I, I don't know. I think it would be kind of cool. But again, messing with the timeline sort of stuff could happen, whatever. Dr. Grady, though, bad guy, bad guy. Uh, that brings up Nathaniel Malik. He has been built up this season to be this delicious villain because you have motive, you have a storyline going forward, you have incredible acting out of it. I mean, the guy's just having fun with the character and it's actually making this last season have a villain where you thought it was going to be something like the Chromicons or Sybil, and it turns out to be Nathaniel Malik. Yeah, that character definitely took me by surprise compared to the setup, because I think this one here, we really saw the fruition of that buildup that they have been doing here, because so much bad happens, and so callously, like, it was, it was a very good portrayal, and for a little bit there, I was thinking, like, what's going on here? This feels off. Like, this just seems like, is this just a throwaway sort of character? And and right here, we had so much bad stuff happen. And I, I was pretty happy with how they used the, that uh, badness, that evilness. And definitely a payoff this episode. Yeah, you can't bring back Powers Booth. You can't do any of that with the storyline that they've already had bill paxton they couldn't bring back but they did their best bringing back characters to revive the evilness that was on screen there 
we had some great moments. We had Daisy having some tremendous moments. Chloe Bennett must have been having a... There's been some episodes in this season where she's been relegated to Team C, basically, and being yeah. window dressing. But she's had some really good episodes as well. The time travel episode last week. In this episode, she had some key scenes. She met her sister, basically. She had moments with her burgeoning romance with Sousa. She met her mom and talked to her mom without her mom knowing that Daisy was her daughter. And then the mom found out and it was a big emotional thing. Then the mom died. Daisy's had to. And then the, again, the quake moment where the entire lighthouse was going to come down. She didn't care. She just wanted to take Malik out. And fortunately, May came along and winged him to the point where he escaped and May went after her and just cut daisy off of her destruction rampant there rampage there but yeah daisy Chloe bennett has had one heck of an episode here i i'm really liking where that character is today versus where sky was in the van in season one absolutely and i thought there were some nice nuances with the daisy character and chloe bennett this episode one of them was the fact that when she was walking down the hall with her mom there the two actresses there played off each other so well to be in sync that you got this whole like family MO feel like it was it was really well done and you could really buy that they were family. They had the same mannerisms and stuff and just scouting the hallway patrol like turning at the same time. I thought that both of them did a fantastic job and Chloe Bennett, her acting is just top notch. and. Quite different than season one. Uh, I watched rewatched an episode not too long ago from season one, and it's it's night and day difference. You also had, and I need to bring this up because I never was a fan necessarily. I mean, I came to the show late, but I was never a shipper of these people. But Dyson Lachlan and Enver were on a show previously. Were you aware of this? No, I didn't know that. No. Oh, you didn't. Yeah. They were in Dollhouse together. Okay. And they actually played dolls that off and on had relationships. And when they were not being dolled up, meaning they were programmed to be somebody else, they had this little relationship thing going on between them, which was great and they actually had a scene together here and on twitter it erupted when they, they were like yeah they're finally together yeah and, I, and i'm like I, i'm not that big of a shipper i realize that there's this fandom out there that there are shippers so i have to acknowledge it but yeah the two had the scene together in the control room uh, it wasn't long but you know the whedons came through and they got the actors back together in a scene one last time A little bit of a side note, side turn here. I just wanted to mention something else that I, I just sort of thought of that I thought was an interesting moment for like relationship wise was when Sousa ends up. There was that whole spin scene. It's at the end where Gemma is getting abducted and Sousa, you just go and you see him, him just quickly turn and throw the shots without even questioning. And trying to get, I forget, what was the character's name? Gemma Simmons? No, the one that was taking her. That would be John Garrett. Oh, that was Garrett. That's right. That was Garrett. Yeah, I forgot. Yeah, that was him. So, so when Garrett, <laughs> thank you. So he, he spins all of a sudden when um, Garrett is trying to take Simmons and he just, he just lets the, just unloads his, his gun without any hesitation, right? It takes you back to that moment in Agent Carter where he would basically just be right there ready to go with anything and just there for Peggy Carter like there was there was just I don't know it just took me back to that moment of no hesitation no pause just he's got these these solid relationship with the team now and it just harkened back to that that team relationship with with Peggy Carter. I don't know. That that moment was re really special for me there. 
Well, not only that, but Susan himself said, I would give anything to have one last moment with some people that he knew yeah. in the past. And you would think Peggy Carter was one of those people, but probably not the only one. So, yeah, I, I understand what you're saying. By the way, that action shot was amazing because he, he I don't think he emptied his whole clip, but and I don't know if it was like sped up or anything, but he turned around, he brought the gun up and it's an automatic or semi-automatic pistol. And he just let off like 10 shots. Just boom, 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 boom. The gun didn't move again, special effects or whatever, but the gun didn't move. Usually it jumps up. If you shot enough, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> the, the recoil gets the gun. So you really only can aim like two or three shots really only two shots before it starts to go wild but yeah he was boom 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 it's just they were gone yeah so he's dealing with all of this stuff he's dealing with people teleporting these superpowers and he's from world war ii yeah right? he's, he's I know. not so he's like oh this just doesn't phase him and he's like what just happened and then what do i do about it they're gone what do i do about it so obviously he went to go find the rest of the team and tell them what happened and and uh they moved ahead also uh, let's talk about another thing. They're in the lighthouse again. And Stephen, I don't know. I'm getting tired of the lighthouse. I don't know if you are or not. I've been tired of the lighthouse for many seasons now. Many. It's only been, <laughs> it's only been one, man. No, because the lighthouse was the future one, too. Wasn't that season five? That was, I thought that was last year. Now, oh, maybe, maybe I'm wrong. Did, did it, maybe I okay you're probably right you're the one that does the podcast <laughs> on agents of shield good question i don't know if that was the rest of the season oh gosh now i got it yeah whatever all right so you have the fact that they're in the lighthouse we're tired of the lighthouse but it's kind of a hodgepodge now because when the agents first got into the lighthouse as the getaway it was strict 1950s tech there is 1980s tech in there, so I have to assume that the team Lighthouse Shield had started to upgrade or whatever. So when the team comes in and they're looking around, they're like, ah, here again, it's 1983, 1983 tech, whatever. And then you have Sousa walking in going, whoa, this is all, <laughs> you understood all that? And <laughs> Daisy's like, yes, yes, oddly enough, I did. <laughs> I love that scene where he is blown away and everybody else is like groaning. <laughs> We're back and, and and I'm glad they're groaning because definitely everybody else is groaning with them. They had the comment. I'm just going to, I'm not going to give commentary here, but they had the comment. And once again, this was filmed last year about fascism being back and that sort of thing. And I don't know if the agents of shield producers and writers had a time machine themselves or not, but they're hitting on all cylinders. None of these references are to what's happening today. It was all last year and beyond so they hit it pretty well and so far they've said that there has been no redialogue no reshooting or anything so i'll have to take them at their word then steven i gotta talk about your favorite thing and it's actually my favorite thing too because i think we're headed there there was another avengers movie reference oh that was so good and i felt so stupid it took me a minute to think about what the reference was when he when Garrett was talking about about seeing Coulson die and what was your favorite one sort of thing, and, and he says something to the effect of, oh, the one with the, the guy with the long hair, took me a minute to realize he was talking about Loki. Exactly. Loki, the guy with the long hair. So we got another Avengers reference, and we've had quite a few of them this year. I yeah. think they're building up to they're actually going into see. And remember, the timeline has changed. Yep. I don't know if they're going to go back into the Avengers scenes and it's all going to be messed up. That'd be cool. And they have to try to fix things because one or more of the superheroes aren't there or something like that. I, I think we might be headed for that and that might be part of the two hour finale or maybe that's just me wishful thinking. It'll turn out that nothing ever happened, that the fact that this is all messed up meant that there was nothing bad that happened and none of the Avengers movies ever happened. Everything was fine. Well, I again, I'm thinking what they're trying to do is wipe all this off of the MCU. All the Inhumans, all the Team Shield stuff, so that it's squarely focusing on the MCU again and nothing ever happened story-wise. No, not wiping everything. They're going to leave the Inhumans TV series, <laughs> the best televisions to be on TV ever. Yeah, I well... 
if that was true, <laughs> then they, I don't think they would have taken afterlife off of the table. And effectively they have, there's no more in humans there. They've killed Jiang, they've killed Gordon and they killed Lee off. There is no more in humans. One of the interesting things though, before we go too far down that path is to consider that we did have a whole season that was fixing their mistakes. And that's where we ended up with today. So as much as I hate seeing wasted plot where we had a whole season of things that are undone, very well could happen, I guess. Well, this is it again, three episodes, two weeks, because the back to back episodes for the finale or so I've heard. John Garrett, there's so many funny moments in here. John Garrett couldn't think of what it meant to disappear from one place and appear somewhere else. <laughs> and you could tell that Coulson was just annoyed as all heck. He's yeah. like, you mean teleported? Yeah, that was that was a funny. I, I thought that was funny, but then I think they did it twice. And the second time it didn't didn't make sense. It was just. It kind of seemed like it should have been a one-off thing. They were trying to make the, it was a writer's thing, trying to make the connection to Gordon and the fact that he got his powers from Gordon and May had to make those connections on her own uh, really fast. Gotcha. It was meant to say May is really good on her feet, but yeah, it was the second time the gag was used. Also, we mentioned this last time. I believe a listener mentioned this last time. Nathaniel has had his powers way longer than Daisy has at this point. And that is how he is able to beat her in the hallway. Yeah, they called it right out there. Uh, and I I'm glad they did. I didn't think about it. Uh, I have to admit, I missed last week's uh, Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. episode. I haven't had a chance to listen yet. So sorry, listener. I didn't catch that yet. And for people like me who didn't make that connection. I'm glad they spelled it out. I'd ask for your predictions here, but that's basically what we've been doing this entire episode of, of <laughs> pontificating what the future of this story is going to be. Next week is the penultimate episode. I'm just going to call it the penultimate episode because <gasps> of the finale. I have a new theory. Oh, yeah. New theory is that everybody comes back from all of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. history. Anybody that was remotely good comes back even some of the bad people come back and they all join the deke squad at least that way maybe deke might get his new drummer <laughs> i mean he was good it's Deanock was a drummer he was set to go back and and, and poor deke and poor deke indeed he was relegated to fixing the zephyr with his earphones on and he was just put in there as a plot piece really to be on the plane when Gemma was kidnapped. Gemma is going to have Diana extracted from her again. She's going to go through all of the same emotional stuff again. She is a little bit prepared for it because they have informed her that she was devastated. Daisy informed her that she was devastated. But I don't think anything's going to be able to prepare her. Uh, when Nathaniel takes Diana out, uh, that's going to be an interesting time on the Zephyr. And I don't think Deke's going to get there in time. And even if Deke does get there in time, Nathaniel's going to take him out. Oh, my heart's broken already. Very sad. Very sad indeed. All right. Is there anything last left that you want to talk about before we move on with the rest of the show? I appreciate you uh, entertaining my wacky ideas that I had and theorized right now. I know you have a whole list of reasons of why I'm incorrect that you chose not to talk about on here. So thank you. Yeah, I mean, it's basically like an episode of Dallas around here every week. This is the third time that we've gotten together to podcast this week. And, you know, that's just tempting fate. It's one time too many each week. I'll pretend I got that reference. Ha <laughs> ha. All right. Next week, I will be talking, hopefully with the ladies, about Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Season 7, Episode 11, Brand New Day, and we will see where we are after that. I'm going to forego news this week. I will just mention the fact that there was a virtual San Diego Comic-Con. There was some Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. activity there, and we might talk about it next week, but 
it is what it is. A lot of the actors are in crew of the show are going around with their, okay, the show is ending. How do you feel about it? Sort of thing. And that would be difficult for me having the last thing to do with the show a year ago and have to come on and talk about it. Like I just got off the set today. That would be difficult. I think people that do participate in shows have enough difficulty with a regular season because they're thinking back a few months and here it's a whole year ago. It's crazy. So hopefully we'll dig some of that up and talk about it. If there is something in particular listener that you want to talk about, let us know and we'll bring up, we will bring it up next time. I did get an email from 084 this week with his feedback on the episode and it was really comprehensive and hit a lot of the same points that we talked about, but I want to give him credit for it. So I'm going to read you this email. We did get it earlier today. I'm not just making this up. It is an actual email that 084 sent me. I will start off by reading it, and he says, Shield 710 feedback. I'm so stressed out. You can't really go wrong with a well-prepared villain, and wow, is Nathaniel Malik prepared. He just oozes dislikability. Is that a word? And you can't wait for him to get his comeuppance. Just the little taste of him momentarily being hurt by Jiang was satisfying, and then watching him kill her for it was just brutal. And with James Paxton doing a pretty decent impression of his late dad and having so much fun doing it, we're left with two incredibly unlikable guys getting the best of our team in nearly every way. And that's honestly where I want to be in two weeks before the two part finale. I'll take my sunshine and rainbows later on. Give me the despair now. He goes on for another couple of paragraphs, but let's stop. Talk about this. Is this where you want to be in a season? To have the despair with three episodes left? I want to be at this point in a regular season. I'm not sure I want to be here in a final season. Now, that's an interesting comment because as far as I'm concerned and as far as the crew is concerned, season five was the finale. These are bonus packs. So does that thinking still hold true? I can't think of them as bonus packs because okay. it's television they're giving me and it is the finale. Whether they wished that season five was the finale, this is the finale and this will be the cap to the series. All right. So 084 goes on and says the rest of the episode impressed me considering the masterpiece that it had to follow. Daisy's first talk with Jiang gave me goosebumps knowing what was in their future. And hearing that future retold through the voice of an a-hole later on wasn't just exposition to me. It was a twist of that knife. Guys, I'm really excited to hopefully watch this guy die. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we didn't really talk much about how he just revealed the future and absolutely deserved acknowledgement. It was painful to watch him just throw one thing after another. When it seemed like it was bad enough and that he had told enough about the future, there was another thing he was he was crushing that relationship with. Think of all the time that he's spent in the time stream just watching this over and over and memorizing it and knowing everything. And it's got to be changed every time he has interaction with Team Shield. It's got to be changing. Yeah, it's crazy. Although. I think a lot of what he's revealing is the original timeline, not necessarily what the new time stream is going to be anyway. And 084 ends with, that'll be all for me this week. I'll just be sitting here wondering why Coulson could instantly remember random bits of history from S.H.I.E.L.D. Academy, but not what John Garrett looked like when they were S.H.I.E.L.D. recruits. I'm pretty sure they were both trained together by Nick Fury. It'll take a little bit of time to headcanon my way around that. Until next time. Yeah, we discussed that before. Yeah, Steven's giving you a high five. He's he's loving that comment right there. Yeah, it's exactly what we were all thinking. They were recruits together. If you go back to season one, they talk about how they're, and I recently watched season one before the season started. They go back and talk about that. So yeah, that is all there. So if you, listener, have any feedback that you want to get to us, you can always email me, stargatepioneer at gettinggeek.com. You can hit us up on our Discord server, at goodygeek.com slash discord or you can tweet us at legends of shield we also have the voicemail which is 844 the bus one 
or 844-843-2871. And I remember that off the top of my head. Time travel, the bus will come back. I've been thinking about that. I definitely yeah. have been thinking about the bus quite a bit. <laughs> I think the bus has got like Lola. We're not going to see the bus. You know what? The bus would be like that 80s technology that they all had to groan over this month or this episode. They would be so disappointed with the bus. The bus literally was from the 80s. So the bus is brand new right now. Oh, hmm. maybe. Which actually it's, it's kind of not true because of season 17. Season 17 didn't really come out until the 90s, but okay. <laughs> let it go. Just let it go. Let it go. So until next week, then I, I think it's best that I, I wanted to say cry our way out of here, but that was really last week. I just want to, uh, I want to go out shocked that there's only three episodes left. This thing that's been six years, six and a half years in the making. We have three episodes. I'm, I'm going to be shocked and get this one out. Also, by the way, to the ladies, just so you know, I will apologize right now for supporting SP on his fact that Fitz is dead. I know that you're aggravated right now at me for supporting that. While I do agree with him, I'll still give you an apology. I apologize. So now I've got the new way to get this one out. I'm going to run away and get this one out before the ladies kill me. Thank you, listener. Thank you, viewer, for leaving all the positive reviews on Apple Podcasts, on Podchaser. Really appreciate all that. Thank you for downloading this podcast. Thank you for all your feedback back and forth. I know Lauren was having a blast tweeting back and forth with everybody once. Once she got on the right channel, basically, to watch the episode last night, there was about four minutes that she missed at the beginning, but then she got right into tweeting. She loved all the back and forth with everybody, and I was watching the responses come in myself, and I didn't want to get in her way, so I didn't mention anything. I just want to say thank you for all of that. You guys are what makes this podcast go. You guys are the reason why we continue to do this show. And I also want to say thank you very much for my guest host, Stephen John Drew, longtime listener, first time podcaster. I really appreciate it, Stephen, for you coming on last minute here. Uh, what's a podcast? It's a miserable little pile of secrets. <laughs> uh, thanks for having me on. Uh, I know you I pale in comparison to the other hosts you usually have on here. And so I'll apologize not only to the ladies for doing a poor job of being here, but to the listeners and the viewers who are also listening and watching me speak. I apologize, but I will thank you, SP, for inviting me on. Yeah, and uh, thank you for lining my wallet with all that great Canadian cash. I mean, it's only worth 25 cents American, but you tried. It's okay. I stole Colson's wallet. <laughs> Bringing it back. Until next time, I'm Director SP. And I'm Executive Assistant to the Traveling Deputy S Director Secretary, Stephen Jonder. Shoe shiner. That's what he is. Shoe shiner. <laughs> See everybody next week. Bye.